Good morning. It's good to see you all out there. Glad to have you here at Lighthouse Baptist. Let's all stand, grab your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 7. We have um, the part of our song leader this morning is going to be played by a young, good looking young fella. He's not wearing plaid, so that's good. <laughs> Fred and Debbie are still on vacation. They'll be back uh, today, later on today, right? Later on today. And so we'll be in prayer for them as they travel this way. And you'll be in prayer for Lisa and I as we travel south. They're coming north. We're going south. Hopefully we won't run into each other, um, literally, but maybe we'll see each other. Who knows? Okay, we are going to start in verse 11, 711 of Hebrews. Our text today is uh, 20 through 28. We're going to begin reading in, in verse 11. The writer of Hebrews goes on talking about Melchizedek and the priesthood, and he says, Therefore, if per perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood, being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of the fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Of course, that better hope is Jesus, right? Verse 20, here's our text for today, 20 through 28. And as much as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For by, by so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness with the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Amen. Amen. Now take your Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter 27. We're going to do our responsive reading right now. Psalm chapter 27. Psalm chapter 27 is an exuberant psalm. It is to be said with enthusiasm and excitement for who Jesus is. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords? Amen. Aren't you thankful that he saves to the uttermost? Amen. Then we ought to read this psalm like we actually mean it. You know, sometimes we sing songs and we're like, I'm so happy, and here's the reason why. Yeah, no. Let your voice reflect the fact that you're excited about what Jesus has done for you. Amen? Amen. All right, let's go. I'll start. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, and this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will not speak, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Behold, I will dwell in 
the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Father God, we thank you for your word. We have read it this morning. Lord, we have listened to it. And Father, I pray that now you will hear our songs, hear our praise, hear, hear us as we glorify you lift your name on high in everything that we will do today. We just want to glorify you because you alone are worthy. You have told us to wait on you, and so we continually wait on you, and but we continue to serve you as we wait. Lord, I pray today that, God, your spirit would just impact this service, and, Father, that there would be an, an overflowing of love and unity and grace, and, Father, that... You, you tell us to come boldly to the throne of grace. And so we come today for, um, for grace to be poured out on, on this, your service, that, this time that we're given to you upon your church. And Father, I pray that not only here at Lighthouse, but all across this world, as the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached and taught um, and lived, Lord, that you would get all of the glory and honor, and that your name would go out boldly, um, and that people might come to know the love and the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. And Father, I thank you for that. God, ask, we just ask that you bless this time as only you can bless. Father, that you would show up and that you would be glorified in everything we say and do. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, stay standing.
Children, you are dismissed to go with Miss Sarepta, kindergarten through fifth grade with Miss Sarepta out back. And Miss Jenny has my crumb crunchers. Well, that's what they are, right? All right. Preschool, you get to go with Miss Jenny. If you don't know where you're going, Miss Jenny will be right back there in the back, waving her hand. Sometimes you'll be able to understand her, sometimes you won't. All right, just uh, get, uh, get that out of the way. All right, we are in Hebrews chapter 7 this morning. Hebrews chapter 7. 
D.E. Host, D.E. Host, was the man who took over after Hudson Taylor had passed away. Hudson Taylor was a uh, missionary to China. Um, in the uh, 1800s, he began uh, mainland, uh, inland China uh, mission, um, and he wrote a book, and that book was entitled Behind the Ranges, Behind the Ranges. And what that book is about is he was trying to analyze a problem that he had been working on. See, he had been working in two different villages in China. And the people whom he lived with and the people whom he worked with were not doing very well. But the people in the other village across the ranges were doing great. He would visit them every now and then. But they were always, every time he visited them, they were doing great. They were doing uh, fine. So he began to ask the Lord, Lord, why are those people across the ranges who I don't see all the time, why are they doing so well spiritually, but the people that I live with and I'm around all the time are not doing so well? What is the difference? What is going on? He, and, and he says, you know, I'm spending all of the time. And so the Lord showed him the answer. He said, you are spending all of this time counseling and preaching and teaching with those whom you are closest to. But the ones who live over there, you don't spend as much time with. You don't see as much. You don't teach them so much. You don't preach to them so much. You don't spend the time with them. You are spending more time praying for them. And so he concluded there were four basic elements in making disciples. You might want to write this down. Number one, pray. Number two, pray. Number three, pray. Number four, teach them the word. Teach them the word in that order and in that proportion. So the question this morning is simply this. How's your prayer time? How's your prayer time? I began a new ritual about two months ago. About, yeah, about seven weeks, two months ago, with my devotions. In my devotions, I began studying a portion of Scripture, or not studying, but reading a portion of Scripture, and that Scripture would be Ephesians 1, 18 through 20, or Ephesians 3, 14 through 19, or Colossians 1, 9 through 14. And as I would read that Scripture, I would pray that Scripture. And as I prayed that scripture, I would pray that scripture in the eyes of my loved ones, the ones that I'm closest to. And so I would go to that scripture, like Ephesians 1, 18 through 20, and I would begin to read it like this. Lord, may the eyes of Lisa's understanding be enlightened, that she may know what is the hope of your calling. What are the riches of of your glory and your inheritance for her? And what is the exceeding greatness of your power toward Lisa who believes according to the working of your mighty power which he worked, which God, you worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand at the heavenly places. And then I would do the same thing for Michael, and then Brandon, and then Lauren, and then Michael's spouse, Heather, and, and Brandon's spouse, Lindsay, and even Lauren's future spouse. Lord, help us all. Uh, and then I would pray for my grandsons that way. And I would pray that over for them. And I, and I have three different ones in here. And so one day, Monday, I would pray this one. Tuesday, I'll pray this one. Wednesday, this one, and then I go back, and every day. And what that has done is I would pray for them specifically so that God would, 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 would enlighten them regarding the eternal hope that he has for them, that they may truly understand the treasures that Jesus has given them, and they may experience his incomparable power. And then I go back, and as I'm praying that, I pray 
for the details. Those, those are general prayers, but then I begin to become more specific, and I begin to pray for Lisa, and I pray for her spiritual life, and I pray for our relationship, and I pray for her in her busy, busy life as she's studying and the things that she's going through and as she's studying for a uh, ladies' Bible study and for the, the, the um, girls that she has to deal with on Tuesday night. Those I spend a lot of time with her on those girls. Um, and, and, and then, you know, you pray for Then any other problems she might be having, and even health things, I pray for her on those things. And I wish I had found this earlier in my life. I wish I had found this earlier in my life. And I wish that I had prayed in greater detail for her and her growth and for my children and their growth and now for my grandchildren. I can say I really do attempt to do the work of prayer over my family and over the church and over other matters. But having said that, I must admit that my prayer life is flawed. Now, I know that all of you have perfect prayer lives, and for me to say that to you is like, wow, pastor's not very cool. He's not very spiritual. But before you start throwing stones at me, look in the mirror. My prayer life is inadequate. And to be honest, all of us are. Why? And I'm going to give you three reasons why. First of all, because of sin. Mine is inadequate because of my sin, which often fogs my understanding of what my family's needs actually are. This, you see, I'm, I'm just being completely honest with you. I have an intrinsic self-centeredness that regularly clouds my perceptions. In other words, I can be completely fine sitting in my office reading and studying God's word and not even paying attention to my family. I'm just being completely honest with you. I know none of you have that problem. None of you are self-centered. You are great people, but that's just number one, my sin. Number two is I have a limited knowledge. Lisa and I have been married will have been married 35 years in July. And I honestly can tell you that I fully do not know everything there is to know about her. Thank you, John. <laughs> now, someone was sharing with me that they've been married for you know, a certain amount of time and they've got their, their husbands trained. Now, I, I, I disagree with them, but that's okay. They can be wrong if they want. Um, they, they think they have their husbands trained. They, here's the thing. We have limited knowledge about each other. We have limited knowledge. But what I do know is this, that marriage between a man and a woman can be trying at times. But it is very joyful at other times. Amen? Amen? Number three, the fact that I am human. I have physical and mental limitations which inhibit both my time and my concentration I give to prayer. My heart's prayers are flawed at best. But thank God there is one who knows no such limitations. He is our high priest. And his name is Jesus Christ. And there's a fruit fly up here that is bothering me. Big time. Listen, Jesus, according to our scripture today, is the priest that is the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And praise God for the revelation that we see in chapter 7 through 10 of Hebrews when he writes this about the fact that he's our high priest. Some of it we sit there and scratch our head and say, I don't understand what he's talking about. It's deep. It's, 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 it's hard. And even in our text today, we can see that. But what we're going to see in our text today is this. Jesus is superior to any priest who's ever lived. Jesus is superior to any priest who's ever lived. And he is our new covenant priest. And so in this section that we're going to see, He's going to give us three consecutive uh, reasons for the superiority of Jesus' priesthood. He's going to tell us that Jesus is superior because God has given us his divine oath. He's going to tell us Jesus is superior because his priesthood 
is permanent. And he's going to tell us that Jesus is superior because of the person of Jesus Christ, who he is, the character of who he, he is. And so we're going to see that the first two reasons are firmly rooted in, uh, in Psalm 110, verse 4, this, this prophecy that's been fulfilled, which says, which we can see, read in here too, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. And that leads us back to what C.S. Lewis said about this entire book, about the entire book of, of Hebrews, is that an expanding soul is going to an encounter an expanding Jesus Christ. As you begin to understand who Jesus is as our high priest, I hope that your soul will become excited about who he is. I hope that your soul will, will, be, will expand because he is our great high priest. And so we'll begin that by looking at verses 20 through 22. Jesus, as our priest, is superior due to a divine oath. Divine oath. Jesus became our Melchizedekian priest because of a divine oath. Look at verse 20. He says, And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn, will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. All right, so what is he doing here? He has given us a contrast. He has given us a contrast between the priesthood that was given to Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother in, the, in, in that position, in the, that position. They were given that priesthood not on the basis of an oath from God, but they were given the priesthood and appointed a priesthood because of divine instruction. In other words, God said this. God told Moses this in Exodus chapter 28. He said, Have Aaron, your brother, brought to you among the Israelites along with his sons so they may serve me as priests. This was followed by an extended ceremony but there was no oath. There was no promise. God did not swear to Aaron or, to, uh, or any other priest that this priesthood would last forever. He didn't say to them, Moses, Aaron's line is going to become the priest, and they're going to be priests forever. Okay? That is so important in today's society because the in Israel today, they are trying to find the lines again and appoint different people. And there is even craziness. There was even a man who, who came, and Sharon found this, who came to uh, the Wailing Wall, and they proclaimed him the Messiah. The leaders proclaimed him as their Messiah. And Jesus said in, in, in Matthew chapter 5, you won't believe me, but others you'll believe. And they will come. So he, this man is just fulfilling Old Testament or New Testament prophecy. Listen, God did not swear to Aaron and say, Aaron, I'm going to make you a priest, and you're going to be a priest forever. How do we know that? Because Aaron died. Because Aaron died. Right? Jesus came, and he did swear. He did swear that his son, God swore that his son, he promised that his son would be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, which is a different order than the order of Aaron. The only other place we know of God giving an oath was in confirming his covenant to Abraham. Look back at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. In, in this, this section, 6, 13 through 18, uh, he gives this promise. And the reason he did was clearly stated by the author of Hebrews. He says in verse 17, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, did what? He confirmed it with an oath. To who? To Abraham. So when it comes to God saying, Aaron, you're going to be a priest. He doesn't say he's going to be a priest forever, but it's going to be passed on through his line that's a word of, from God. In other words, God has given his word. And God's word is enough. Why? Because God's word is truth. There are people all over looking for truth. And they are looking for truth on CNN, 
on MSNBC, on Fox News. They are looking for truth from people who are political leaders, from experts. Well, let me tell you, the only expert that I know of is God. And his word is truth. We need to turn to God's word and get into God's word and see what God says and not listen to the things of this world. Listen, God accommodated himself within the sphere of, of, of human uh, undependability. His, his oath is a double assurance to man. It is a double assurance that he's going to give us a priest. And he's going to tell us, my word is truth, but in case you don't believe me, I'm going to give you an oath that I'm going to give you someone who is greater than Melchizedek. I'm going to give you someone who is greater than anybody else who's ever lived in this world. Whatever God confirms by an oath becomes something so utterly, utterly unchangeable that it is woven into the very fiber of the universe. Let me repeat that in case you're writing this down or you just messed up because I was tongue-tied here. God confirms by an oath because something so utterly unchangeable that is woven into the very fiber of the universe and it must remain forever. In other words, if God has spoken something, it is truth forever. Forever. Why? Because God's character is truth. God is truth. And so the result of his self-imposed, eternally binding oath is from verse 22. Look at the bottom, the last part of verse 22 of chapter 7. He says, uh, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. In other words, he is a guarantee. Jesus is a guarantee of a better covenant. And so let me give you two reasons why that's important. First of all, the writer places Jesus last in the Greek sentence structure of verse 20 through 22. He puts him last in there, okay? And that is why, because all of the weight of verse 20 through 22 is going to fall on this last section. All of everything he says, and as much as he was not made priest without an oath, he's given us an oath, okay? He's given us an oath. Why? Verse 21, for they have become priests without an oath. All those other priests came along. They weren't given an oath. But Jesus has come along. He's given them an oath. And what's happened? Verse 20, 21 says, uh, and he quotes uh, Psalm 110, verse 4, that that, that that prophecy is going to be fulfilled by no one but Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can fulfill it. Okay? And the second thing we need to understand is the writer uses the the Greek word here, uh, the, the, the name here, Jesus. Jesus means he will save his people from their sins. So here is your guarantee. Jesus Christ is going to come. He's going to come for one purpose, to save his people from their sins. And the emphatic youth of Jesus consciously is going to cause us to recall four things about him. When you start thinking about Jesus, the first thing that ought to pop in your mind is the incarnation. The incarnation is when Jesus was born in a manger and we celebrate Christmas. And that's all we think about is Jesus in the manger. Oh, he's so sweet. There is more to that story than just Jesus being a baby. That is God himself becoming man, becoming flesh, and dwelling with us, living with us. Jesus Christ became flesh and dwelt with us, becoming a human instrument, just like you and I have. He became that human instrument for us. The pain that plays in our heart plays in his as well. That is perfection. He understands. He sympathizes with us. He understands what we're going through. 
He understands the struggle and the pain that we have in our heart when we lose a loved one. He understands the pain and the struggle that you have in your heart when someone is sick. He understands the pain and the struggles we have when we're dealing with situations in our life. He understands everything about it. Because why? Because he became man and dwelt with us. But there's more to his incarnation. His incarnation was terminated when he became the propitiation. That's a big word. It means substitution. He, a, he became the propitiation for our sins on the cross. And that's, a, that's a whole idea. When we think about Christmas, we ought to automatically begin to think about Passover and Good Friday and Easter, which we just celebrated last week, and think about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And if that's not enough, then we ought to start thinking about his ascension. That not only did he rise from the grave, but he ascended to heaven. And he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And if that's not enough for you, then there's one more big word I want to share with you. And that's the word intercession. Because that's what he's doing for you right now. He's been doing it through the ages. He's been praying for you and for me throughout eternity. He will do that. Listen, he's been doing that for us. And so the author's point here in this, in this verse, in, in this letter, is that, um, is that in heaven, Jesus, who died, who, who, died all, who did all of this for us, now acts as our guarantee. He is our guarantee for those who are still on earth. You've seen the commercials. Money back, guaranteed. Right? So you buy something and it's broken and you send it back and money back, guaranteed. You get it back in six weeks. Right? It's money back, guaranteed. Here's the guarantee you have with Jesus. When you come to Jesus Christ, and you have him as your Savior, and you are following him and believing him as your Lord of your life, you are guaranteed a place in heaven forever. Now, now catch this. And you will not ever lose it. It is yours. Because of you? No, because of him. He is our great one who guarantees us. That is the better covenant. So we have a superior priest. We have the Father's sworn word. But second law, second law, we have um, the Son's guarantee, and we have a. We see that Jesus is superior because He is permanent. Because of His permanence. Look at verse twenty-three. He says, "Also there were many priests, because they were prevented by death from continuing, but He, because He continues, how long?" forever has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for him. So the Father's oath confirming the eternality of Jesus' priesthood anticipates that he is superior. When you look back at the priesthood of Aaron, that whole thing demonstrates that that is not permanent. When Aaron, the first priest, had served his term, God took him and replaced him with his son, Eleazar. And there, the, in Scripture, in Numbers 20, 28, we read that Aaron died on the mountaintop, and Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. Aaron, or Eleazar then, would, later on, he would die, and he would be replaced by Phineas, who would then be replaced by Ferb. Some of you will get that later. Those of you that are older won't get, ever get it. But they, what, what, is, what is he saying? That every single one of these men that were given the priesthood, the high priest, died. Every single one of them died and were replaced. In fact, um, Josephus said, uh, reckons that there were some 83 uh, priests that served from Aaron until the destruction of the second temple in A.D. 20 or 8070, but the Talmud lists even more. It says that there were 18 during the first temple and over 300 during the second. So they don't even know how many there are. 
But here's the point. All of them died. In Mark contrast, the author says in verse 24, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. That the Greek word for permanent can have the sense of unchangeable or, or permanent, as our translation has it. Um, and it can mean that the, the priesthood, get this, is non-transferable. It's non-transferable. Philip Hughes says this about it. He says, the term is enhanced by its ambivalence. The priesthood of Christ does not pass to another precisely because it is a perpetual priesthood. Here's the reason why. It is Jesus, it is his priesthood, because Jesus never changes. The Bible tells us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That the same Jesus who created the world and spoke it into existence, who was truthful and honest and, and had full of integrity, is the same Jesus who went to the cross and is the same Jesus who is alive today, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And his word that he gave us all along the way does not change. Okay? It doesn't change. Look, things in the church may change. Programs may change. But the word of God never changes. The society can try and change it, but they, it doesn't change. You can take God's word and say, well, God said that, that marriage was between a man and a woman, but we think marriage is between a woman and a woman or a man and a man. That doesn't make it right. Just because you write it down on paper doesn't make it right, right? I mean, I can sit here and say, well, Elijah is the greatest person who ever lived. I wrote it down, so it's true. Let's talk to Sarepta about that. I'm only picking on him because Fred's not here. Look, God's word doesn't change. And so in that, we see two things. First of all, we see that there is total salvation. There is total salvation. Verse 25 is dramatically shows us that, that it is super sufficient for, for salvation, Jesus is. He says, therefore, Jesus, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for us. So he says this, he's able to bring us to God. Now, now look, some of you that are, that are not teenagers will remember the name Jeffrey Dahmer. Some of you teenagers may remember that name. Jeffrey Dahmer was a, was a, a mass murderer. He was a convicted serial killer, right? I mean, he was, he was, he was gross. He was disgusting, Amen. I mean, no doubt about it, one of the famous, infamous criminals in United States history. Dr. James Dobson was asked to come to, to talk to him. Dr. Dobson is a believer, and, and he was on the radio and on TV, and he's put out a lot of books, and he went to death row, and he shared Jesus Christ with him. He said that Jeffrey Dahmer accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now, I don't know what you think of that, I have two reasons of thought on that, okay? First of, my first thought is this, that Jeffrey Dahmer may have been mouthing pious, con conventional Christian phrases that he had picked up along the way in, in his life. That is completely possible. It is completely possible that he repeatedly uh, demonstrated an amazing ability to deceive others, and he might have deceived Dr. Dobson. That is completely possible. The second thought on that is that he truly turned to Jesus Christ. He truly confessed his sin. He is trusting. He trusted him alone for his salvation. He has been saved. He has been totally forgiven of every sin. Why is that possible? Because on the cross, Paul says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, Jesus became a curse for us. And because Jesus fully took on himself our sins, the gospel has been able to go around and penetrate 
the dark alleys of society and people's lives. So it is completely possible that when we get to heaven, if you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you will see Jeffrey Dahmer there. It is completely possible. Now, here's the thing. Only two people know if he's there. Jeffrey Dahmer and God. Okay? I don't know, and I'm not going to tell him that he is or not, but here's what I do know, that the gospel of Jesus Christ can save any murderer, any any prostitute, any transvestite, any homosexual, any abortionist, any murderer, any cannibal, any gossiper there is in this world. And it is still the same today from Helsinki, Finley to Hurricane West Virginia. And why I picked Helsinki, I have no idea. Here's the thing. It's amazing that you and I and Jeffrey Dahmer, if he truly believed, are as righteous and pure as Jesus Christ. If we have trusted with him, if we, if we have believed in him, we have received his righteousness. And if you are revolted by the possibility that Jeffrey Dahmer is in heaven, then you don't understand the cross of Jesus Christ. Our text argues emphatically, verse 25, he is able, he is able to save completely, utterly, those who, came to, who come to Jesus, to God through Jesus Christ. And that term, uttermost or completely, combines the idea of completeness with the idea of eternity. You are saved for all time. The the word literally means complete, absolute, total, eternal salvation. The words allow for no possibility of our supplementing, supplementing our salvation by doing good. Salvation is... All Christ's work from beginning to end. You and I have only done one thing for our salvation. We have sinned. He did it all. We have done nothing but sin. Salvation is complete. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what he's done. Now notice one more thing in this, and then we're going to move on. That word, uh, he is able to save to the uttermost or completely. Get this. It's in the present tense. So that what does that mean? That he is right now saving people. Right now, all across this, all across this globe, he is saving people. And people are coming to know Jesus Christ. People are coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. The reference is, is not just a, a great initial, not just a great initial experience of being saved, but it is a continual experience. It is continual until when? Until eternity. He will save us all the way to the end. Forever and ever and ever. It's not one of these things where you say, Well, I think I'm saved today. I woke up today and thought, hey, today's Sunday. Yes. I get to go preach. It's an exciting day. It's the only day I work. That's what Lori tells me. It's the only day you work. So, listen, it, it is exciting. But it ought to be exciting every day. Someone who said this, for believers, this is hell. And we can make it terrible. And we walk around with bitterness and anger and resentment on our face. Or we can say, "Woo! I'm glad I'm not going to hell. But let me just tell my friends and neighbors about how great Jesus is. Next thing is, i got to really move here. There's total intercession. All right, so how, how does he do this? Well, look at the last part of verse 25. The last part, he says, um, it says he always does what? He always what? He always what? He always what? He always what? Jesus is alive. 
I mean, you know, we celebrated that last week, so we're over that. We'll just move on. Not. Jesus is alive. And we ought to be excited about that fact, that he is alive. Um, and, and, and celebrate who, how great he is. He, he is alive, and he makes intercession for us. That's, that's a purpose. And that speaks to, to, to one um, who, who is given to him. And to, it speaks to one of the great uh, flaws of, 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 of our human intercession. That, you know, for us, we pray. You know, but my physical and mental weakness dictates that I don't pray all the time. I pray intermittently. Um, you know, I, I grow weary in praying. And my mind, I, I know your, your guys' mind doesn't do this, but there's times when I'm sitting there praying and my mind wanders to what I'm going to be doing today. My mind wanders to what I did today, to, to, during the day and thinking, what, what am I, you know, I know your mind doesn't do that, but mine does. And I grow weary in time. And sometimes when I hear the Spirit as he tells me what to do, I disobey him. Sometimes he's calling me to pray, and I don't pray. Sometimes I should pray, but I don't. Or sometimes somebody asks me to pray for them about something, and I'll say, I'll pray for you, brother. And what's that really saying? I don't want to be bothered with you right now. And what should I really be doing when somebody comes to me? Let me pray with you right now. Because I know my own instant, I'll forget about it. And I know this is true for me and not true for some of you, but there's times in my prayer life where I fall asleep. I'm just being honest here. But here's the great thing. Jesus never falls asleep. Jesus never disobeys. Jesus never grows weary. Jesus, his mind never wanders. In fact, the writer puts it this way. Turn over to chapter 9, verse 24. The writer of Hebrews says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true. Now he's talking about the holy of holies and, and the temple. Jesus hasn't entered in there, but he's entered into heaven itself. Why? To appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest and as the whole the most holy place every year with blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he's appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What has Jesus done? He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He is, he is, he is sharing and speaking and praying for us. Paul says, he, who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised in life and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And what is he doing? He's interceding for each and every one of us. Why is Jesus interceding with each and every one of us? Here's the amazing thing. You know how sometimes when you're with a loved one, you're with them, but yet you're not paying attention to them? I know that you guys don't do that with your wives, that you're always in tune and your wife never says what my wife says to me all the time. I, are you paying attention to me? Did you hear what I had to say? Here's the amazing thing about Jesus. God never has to ask him, what are you thinking? God never has to ask him, who are you praying for? His relationship with the Father is unbroken. His intercession is never ending. Day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, year by year, millennium by millennium, Jesus Christ is praying for us. He takes, along with the Holy Spirit, our feeble prayers, he cleans them up, he enables them, and he presents them to the Father. A 4th century preacher by the name of Christostian said it this way, and he provides this great helpful analogy. He said it this way. He said, the young boy whose father was away on a trip wanted to present his father with something that would please him. So his mother sent him to the garden to gather, uh, to gather a bouquet of flowers. The little boy gathered a sorry bouquet of weeds as well as flowers. And when his father returned home, he was presented 
with a beautifully arranged bouquet by his mother who had intervened and removed all the weeds. You see, you and I have feeble prayers, amen? And they're weak. And we don't know words to say sometimes. But the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit takes those prayers and he pulls out all the weeds and he replaces them with beautiful flowers. And he delivers them to the, to the son who then takes out anything that might, might not even look good and delivers them to the father. And the father receives them and goes, ah, the aroma is beautiful because he loves the aroma of the prayers of the saints. We have weak prayers, but God cleans them up. And that's what Jesus does for us as he sits at the right hand of God the Father. Every prayer hits the mark and graces our life. The reason he can save us completely is because he's always interceding for us because he is alive. He is infinite um, and we are finite. Um, he, so number three, the third thing we see here is there, that Jesus is superior due to his person. Verse 26 through 28. <clears throat> for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for his people's. For, it, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. So we have God's sworn oath. We have the fact that he is a permanent priest for us. And now we see he is superior. Why? Because of who he is. Because of who he is. Christ's intercession is superior, whereas mine is flawed because of my sin and because of my character. His character is unflawed because he's sinless. He's perfect. He's holy, we're told here in verse 26. He is God's holy one who is set apart. He stands accepted before, before God. Why? He is blameless. Literally, he is without evil. He is pure. That means he is unstained. The Old Testament priests had this list of guidelines to help them, but all those lists were of external um, looks and appearance and everything else, and they had to be perfect. There couldn't be anything wrong. With Jesus, he walked this muck and mire of this world for 33 years and yet was without sin. Yet with, is without sin. Some of us can't even go 33 minutes without sin. Amen? Or oh me, right? Look, his character rendered him immune. Because why? Because he's holy, he's blameless, he's pure, he's, he's set apart from, diff, from sinners. He, he is part of humanity because it took it all on himself. And finally, he is exalted above the heavens, which is an allusion to the triumph of his resurrection, his ascension, his glorification, that he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. In, in contrast <clears throat> to my flawed intercession due to my human weakness and sin, Jesus Christ in his transcendent glory is not just a figure of the past, but he's also the present and the future. His intercession is not as powerful. For, his intercession is as powerful for us today as it was for those disciples in the first century. Do you believe that? Say amen. Do you believe that? Say amen. If you believe that, then you believe that God would do the same for you that he did for Peter. When Peter was put in prison, Peter was sleeping. And God sent an angel to rescue him. And Peter thought it was a vision, but it was true. And if God can rescue Peter from prison, can he not rescue you from your prison of, the, of your sin? Yes, he can. And yes, he will. He will rescue you. He can do the same for you. Listen. Human priests, because of their sin, had to offer sin for themselves yearly before they could go into the Holy of Holies. Jesus came and offered sin once for all, for all of eternity. One time. He was and is infinite, 
infinite and he is infinitely pure and is in his infinity he created everything everything there is to do everything there is and his sacrifice is sufficient it was sufficient for those first century believers it's sufficient for all believers of all time including today including today so the text concludes in verse 28 The law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son. Who's the Son? Jesus, who has been perfected for how long? Forever. Jesus is superior. He is a superior priest because God swore his priesthood into existence because his priesthood is permanent and because his person is perfect. The outcome is inevitable and the outcome is eternal. In Saudi Arabia, according to Arab custom, reinforced by a 1952 decree of King Abdul Aziz, every subject, every person has the right to of access to the ruler. Whether it is a ruler of a tribal sheik or a governor or the monarch himself. To present petitions or complaint or pleas for help. Even the poorest Saudi citizen can approach his sovereign to plead a cause. Crown Prince Faid Speaking about this custom, said this, quote, Anyone, anyone can come here, meaning the palace, that gives them confidence in their government. They know they may look to us for help, end quote. Every believer, every follower, every disciple of Jesus Christ has the right to approach an even greater monarch. You have the right to approach the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and go to the throne of grace boldly, boldly. That is worth a hallelujah. Frankie were here, he would be shouting double hallelujah. Now listen, how dare we, children of God, believers of Jesus Christ, take our complaints our pleas, our grievances to anyone else but the King of kings and Lord of lords. Either we are his children or we are not. Either Jesus is sufficient for us in this day or he is not. And if you believe that he's not, then you better look inside your heart to make sure that you really are his child. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he was good enough to save those in the first century and good enough to save those in the Old Testament, he's good enough to save us today. And if he was good enough to help those people, he's good enough to help us. If he's good enough to provide for them, he's good enough to provide for us. So don't turn to anyone else. Turn to Jesus. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will save, because he can save, to the uttermost. Let's pray. What a great priest we have. What a great priest we have. He saves to the uttermost. Either you're his children or you're not. If you're not his child, then today, why don't you take this moment to look inside your own heart and confess it to him. If, you, if he is tugging at your heart right now and you don't know him as your Savior, I'm going to say a prayer. You say something like that to him, meaning it from the bottom of your heart, meaning it from the bottom of your heart that you want him to save you from your sin. Tell him and just say, God, I'm a sinner. You're confessing to him what he already knows. I ask you to come into my heart. Come into my life. Save me. Forgive me from my sin. Help me to live for you. 
I confess that I need you as my Savior. I can't do it on my own. And save me today. In Jesus' name. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer of Jesus Christ, but you're just not trusting in Him about something. Why not take this moment and just turn it over to Him? Right now, right where you are. I don't know what it is. I don't know what, where, what it is. Maybe it's a fear that you have. A doubt that you have. Just turn it to Him. Tell Him. God, you saved me. I believe that you're also Lord and that you can take care of this problem, whatever it is. Name it. Your relationship with someone. A sin that you're dealing with. Finances. Struggle that you're going through. Whatever it is, turn it over to him. And be reminded that he's able to take care of it. Better than you. Better than I. Better than 10,000 people. Just take it to the throne of grace. Now leave it there. Now move on. Because he's come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Joyful. Leave it there with him. Father God, have your way in our hearts today. May the Spirit of God show us and convict us of sin in our life. Help us to confess that. Help us to walk in your boldness and your strength, knowing that we serve a risen Savior who's on the throne, seated at the right hand of God Almighty, and he's interceding for us because he loves us. He gave his life for us. Lord, we give back to you, all of it to you. May you be first place in everything we do and say. May you be glorified. Will God break our heart for you and for lost people all over this place, all over this world. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for how great you are in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a couple of prayer requests, a couple of announcements, a couple of prayer requests for you. Um, all right, announcements. There's no finance board meeting. We'll be meet next Sunday. Um, April's Closet is next weekend. So if you can help, um, is Danielle here? She's in the nursery. All right, she's with more crumb crunchers. Um, if you can help see Danielle or sign up on the, on the sign-up sheet, she needs help on Thursday night, uh, Friday, and, of course, Saturday. Um, and then Secret Sisters having a reveal thing on May 15th. Um, I don't want to know. Uh, 24 hours of prayer, just sign up back there for 24 hours of prayer. It's in 15-minute slots. You can more, take more than one. You can take two, three, four, how many, eight, how many you feel like praying. Um, but we're praying for revival. Um, Lord knows we all need it. And then as you go out, um, you'll see this whole patch of, well, it's probably mud now because it rained, but uh, a dirt that we spread out. That's where the pavilion's going to be. Um, and and um, it's been marked off with these red stakes. Um, and so you'll see that's what the pavilion will look like. So just picture um, the, p the pad there and the wood, and it's all going up. And it's not going to go up automatically. We tried that yesterday. We waved our wands. It didn't work. So as we get material and needs, we will be in contact with you. If you had, did not sign up, please sign up and let us know you can help. Somebody says, does it have to be men? No. We'll take women, children, grandchildren, you know, whatever. Just anyone who can help. Um, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Prayer requests. I've got several here. Um, this is from Barb. Barb Kearns. Good to see you, girl. Nice to have you here. Uh, Barb Kern's granddaughter, Malia Kearns, um, is having some very serious major surgery on April 22nd. So we need to take her to the throne right now. M many of you that know Malia know she has physical problems. Um, she's going to be at, at Children's Hospital in Cincinnati. So please, please, please pray for Malia Kearns. Also, this is um, from Donna. Um, uh, 
Donna Smith, her nephew, Donnie Savaja. Did I get it right? Savaja. Uh, he has a severely damaged liver. Um, no surgery scheduled, but pray for him. Um, pray for him uh, as well. Continue, uh, and then be in prayer for Teresa White's mother. Um, give me your first name. Charlene. I, I was going to say Charlene. I would have been right. Um, she had uh, three stents put in. Um, she's home, so be in prayer for her. And then um, my beautiful daughter has COVID, so be in prayer for, for her. Long, long story. Uh, we'd be here forever, and I'm not going to do anything else. And then secondly, and then lastly, really sad news. Um, Ryan, I'm going to cry. The little boy that sat in the wheelchair back there passed away. Um, I have no information on uh, anything. They haven't called me back and let me know when the funeral will be or memorial or anything else. But um, be in prayer for Cindy. She's had it rough the last year, lost Jeff. Uh, like a year ago and now Ryan and so be in prayer for Cindy um, and um, many as well okay anything else yes sir oh yeah uh, Ed's a new great grandfather um, but be in prayer for that young baby and his granddaughter um, as well okay and Vi as she babysits her granddaughter granddaughter it's a grandson right the new one's a grandson, right? Wayne. It's a good name. That was my dad's middle name. <coughs> um, John. <laughs> I was going to say Bruce, but you know. Um, <clears throat> anything else? All right. Remember us as we travel today. It's good to see you all. Let's all stand and be dismissed in prayer. Brother Elijah, will you dismiss us in prayer, please?